Yeah, it was Search. a search for Spock, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. And, and that was, to me, a total uh, theater costume, wasn't it? I mean, you know, all this braiding and the leather and the, uh, you know, the sleeves with that kind of cartridge pleating. Yep. I mean, those costumes weighed a ton. Yep. And, and luckily, Star Trek cast a lot of theater actors who really knew how to wear costumes. You know, who weren't going, wah, wah, it's hot, wah, wah, it's too heavy, or, you know, whatever. This is a, uh, a really fun evening, well, afternoon into the evening. So really quickly, if you're not familiar with Artisans Asylum, we're a 40,000 square foot uh, fabrication wonderland. We're just down the road on Somerville Avenue on Tyler Street. Um, after this talk, we'll have a reception where you will be able to uh, just kind of hang out with Maggie, see some of her artwork. There's some fan-made plasma art down there, which is pretty cool. And um, our members have been hard at work building a replica of Quark's Bar. So it should be a fun time. Please come down afterwards, text your friends, tell them. Um, today is kind of a special day. It's one of our first um, fundraisers in a while, so that's really important to us. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. We rely on um, the goodwill and generosity of our community to sustain ourselves. Um, so we are incredibly grateful to have um, Karen Christians and Maggie Spock organizing and putting together this fantastic talk. Um, uh, yes, let's give it up for Karen. I'm going to ask her to come out now since we got a woohoo. Come on out, Karen. Big hug. All right. So Karen <laughs> came to me, I don't know, like a lot of times, with a lot of ideas. Um, but she came up with this one. She came back from LA and she was all spun up. I just went to LA, you're never gonna guess who I met. And um, she had met Maggie Spock, who I understand you're working on a book mm -hmm. with her. Um, Not with her, but a part of it, yeah. Part of it is about? It's called Jewelry of Star Trek. Okay. It's the second one on my other book. All right. So, um, very excited to um, engage uh, Maggie's talent, her legacy, um, in some way, that would connect with the spirit of the makers who are at the asylum. Um, I'm going to let it go here and let Karen tell you a bit about that. But one more time, thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I was very touched that this kind of fundraiser would be centered around my passion, which is jewelry. And I don't think that's ever happened before. So I have to thank Lars, and I have to thank Artisans Asylum for standing behind me and my crazy ideas for the love of jewelry and for the love of jewelry makers. But maker is one of that key words, because what we are, in fact, many of you, many of us, are makers, and we love to make. And to me, this was the perfect dovetail to have both makers and other makers come together and come for this spectacular talk and spectacular evening and a great place where we all get to hang out and play, which is at Artisan's Asylum. So a little bit about Maggie. Oh, I didn't put it in the space. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm going to read this. I hope you don't mind. Studio, art metal shop proprietor, preeminent jeweler, metal worker, and New York native. Maggie Spock was born into the industry. Her father was a film actor, Millard Mitchell, who sewed, knitted, and taught his daughter how to tie good, knot, good bows. Following his death in 1953, after shuttling between East and West Coasts, the family grew up assuming she would be an actor. She attended Pasadena Playhouse in the early 1960s, where she majored in acting, but found that she was spending more and more time with the tech students in the costume shop where she was drawn to making things instead of performing. After college, she often acted, designed and made the costumes for theater productions. One day, a director pointed out that she could earn money with her design skills and gave her the name of Al Nickel at the Western Costume Company. Within a month, she had a job. She married Tom Brown, a metal sculptor and artist who worked at the Western Costume Company in the art prop department. 
When Bill Rahill, owner of the metal shop on the sixth floor, decided to retire in 1971, Maggie and Tom bought the shop. Although they had no experience, the duo became a force in the film industry, creating the armor worn in Masters of the Universe, the championship belt in the Rocky films, and fabricating jewelry and insignias for the Star Trek films, costume designer Robert Fletcher, who served as a mentor to the couple. As time passed, their projects became bigger and more labor intensive. Their team grew. They decided that special effects wardrobe was no longer their focus. Although they would still do the armor for principals on the Chronicles of Riddick and other projects, jewelry and insignias became their specialty. Crowns and tiaras of all types and periods for films such as The Princess Diaries, Black Swan, and the television series The Tudors offered a fun and fulfilling path for Maggie going forward. I am very, very pleased to present Maggie Spock. This is a major wow. I'm really surprised and so gratified that uh, the asylum would pick me to have come and do this. You know, when you're making something, you're just making it. It's your job and it's what you do. And it doesn't dawn on you that anyone, you know, really cares except for insofar as how it fits in a movie and does somebody look ugly and so but that's what that's what makers are important because hopefully we add a lot to how a film looks and so all my most sincere gratitude to Artisans Asylum for having me here and letting me talk to you all. Yay. All right, let's the interview begin. Where were you born, Maggie? Uh, St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City, 1944. And then you moved to New Rochelle? New Rochelle, where my grandparents lived, which was a very nice place to grow up. You know, it, was, it had woods you could play in. And, you know, I always imagined it was the 100-acre wood from Winnie the Pooh, but, you know, it was my woods, and I liked it. And what was your childhood like there? Oh, it was good. Um, yeah, it was, you know, my dad was still alive. I had two, you know, two active grandparents, and, and it was a, one of those big old Victorian houses from there, lots of secret places, and, you know, collected, uh, like to collect acorns. You know, like, like that's a collection, you know. <laughs> but I would put them in milk bottles and put them in my room until pretty much it was... The acorn room. <laughs> <laughs> so we have your dad here, Millard Mitchell. Oh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Uh, he was born in 1903, and uh, oddly enough, in Cuba, I think his father worked for an early refrigeration company or something. And uh, he and his sisters all lived in Brooklyn most of their life, and apparently, he just had a series of crappy jobs. And one time he was taking tickets at a theater um, in New York and uh, they said, you know, so-and-so is sick. Come in and do this. All you have to do is get shot and die. <laughs> you know, there's no lines, but the guy's gone, so we do that. And then he did it and it was kind of fun and he liked it and you got paid for it. So uh, he was in a lot of what's called George Abbott comedies uh, in the 30s and then um, started drifting into movies playing second bananas mostly in, but always in pretty good <coughs> movies like Double Life and Kiss of Death and stuff like that. He's playing detectives <coughs> and FBI guys and Mr. 880, he was an FBI guy. And uh, then he got a real crack agent and got a movie called A Foreign Affair that was directed by Billy Wilder. And he gave my dad the closing shot. And, you know, really, after that, he always had first featured billing. And 
you know, he was set to play the general in White Christmas when he died. And uh, so that was a, the sort of thing, I was nine, that's the sort of thing that totally upends your life in major ways. But he did make things, I just want to say that. He decorated for Christmas like nobody's business. <laughs> you know, there was a, he'd make a diorama under the Christmas tree before we got up in the morning, you know, we didn't know. And it was all dark blue and mom said he would go out and figure out where the stars were and then he put those sticker stars on it. Great. And then he had all these little villages underneath and the old Lionel train going around and it was a good way to grow up, yeah. So I understand that Gypsy Rose Lee taught your dad how to crochet. Yes, she was, she, <laughs> he was in a play with her, I think it was called See My Lawyer. <laughs> I think Milton Burrow was in it too. And, uh, uh, and, you know, he just thought she was great. And she was just a real nice person. And she always knitted and crocheted backstage. And she taught him how to do it. And he made afghans always for the house. And Mom said he would sit there in the little house we had on Long Island. And he'd sit there with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, making, making curtains, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, you know, not, you didn't think that was weird then, because that's just what your dad did, you know. Just did that. And when did you move to L.A.? Sort of in, in stages, when he started working. At, it's sort of like, except for one house, um, we only stayed for six months you know, while he was working on a picture or something. So then we, the New Rochelle house was always there. So, you know, it was a lot of moving from school to school. And, um, and so, but we moved here permanently after, after dad died because there was no, and because that same year my grandfather died. I mean, this is nothing you want to hear about. But so then my mom <coughs> and I had no reason to go back either. And her whole thing was when she got to LA, she'd never even been west of Pennsylvania. And um, when my dad brought her to LA, they got off the train at the Pasadena station, which is just a beautiful station with big palm trees and Victorian buildings. And, um, and she said, you mean this has been here all my life and nobody told me? <laughs> and, and so, you know, she was really excited to be in a place where she didn't have to wear girdles all the time, and you know, I went to do yep. different life. So, tell me about your time at the Western Costume Company. It was a great and frustrating experience. You know, I when I started there in 1967, that was like right at the end of the great big musicals. Right when I was there, they were shooting Star. And um, which was like the biopic of, of Gertrude Lawrence and uh, with Julie Andrews and where she had something like 140 costume changes. You know, I mean, it was just like bang, bang, <coughs> bang, bang, bang. Another outfit, another outfit. And Hello Dolly, the Barbara Streisand Hello Dolly. And so it was really the last of the great old designers, Irene Sheriff and people like that, Dorothy Jenkins, who I was honored to be able to work for Dorothy and uh, on Little Big Man, and uh, <clears throat> which was close to her last film. She did theater stuff after that. But, and, uh, but as a lowly person, you're supposed to put away stock, which you have to do because you have to know where everything is. And... Um, Take private rentals. If you guys want something for Halloween, you know, you come. Going to a theme party, we won't talk about what theme. And, uh, and then you kind of graduate to doing schools and theaters where they give some school here, will send a measurement sheet, you know, and they're doing the Miracle Worker and, you know, or the Crucible or something. And you, you know, go and you get the measurement sheet. And you always tell these people, Please don't lie on your measurement sheet. <laughs> this is somebody, you, you want to know your real measurements because you don't want to get something that doesn't fit. And, but people just did. I don't know what's wrong with people. It's <laughs> really bizarre. And then after you've been there a while, you graduate to made to order. 
So that's when you're working for the big designer. And it's a very stressful job because you're ordering all the fabric, shopping for the shoes, you know, making sure the leather guy's got the leather to make the shoes, that the milliner is doing it, that everybody's, you know, when are the fittings? I mean, you got to... It's, it's very stressful. And I wasn't that crazy about doing the made-to-order stuff because everybody yells at you. You know, the, the store yells at you because you didn't order on time. And, you know, the workroom yells at you because they didn't want this ply silk, they wanted some other ply silk. And, you know, it's just constant, horrible pressure. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I had this a few designers I like to work with and I just stayed with them, and then the stuff started happening with the metal shop. And for a while, we made so little money at the shop that Western, and Western didn't want to hire anybody, that they would kind of keep me on like two days a week, three days a week. So if one of my designers who liked me was in town, I'd just float down there and kind of do their stuff. And finally, they said, the union is getting really mad. You can't mm-hmm. do this anymore. <coughs> So that was the end of that, and then we were just upstairs. And when did you meet Robert Fletcher, and how did he change your life? Oh, he changed our lives in major, major ways. Uh, For those who don't know, Robert Fletcher was one of the costume designers uh, for a lot of the Star Trek movies. First four. First four movies, and he's the one who, when I was looking through a lot of his drawings, would always put jewelry, and we would never leave out the, the sort of thing that made, you know, made the folks. So you that tell me a little it. about... Well, we first met him because he was doing a <coughs> theater show at Western. I think it was the Trojan Women. And he uh, came up to the shop. We were on the sixth floor. And the workrooms and stuff were on the second floor. And, um, and he said, I want you guys to make me an amethyst brooch that's going to hold a cape together. And I want the amethyst to be about this big. Mm-hmm. and have it set in silver. And Tom and I just sort of said, well, you know, amethysts don't come that, that big. And if they did, they'd be mighty expensive amethysts. And he says, no, no, you'll figure out a way to make it. And that really was his whole thing. So we just thought, well, Tom used to make some boxes with what you kind of are adventuring into a uh, resin in light. So we thought, well, we could make resin rocks. And so we started out by just making like a aluminum frame and just pouring a bunch of resin in and swirling other colors to it so it wouldn't just be like ple- like plexiglass or something. So it'd have shadow and, and, uh, and then just grinding the sucker on these huge grinding wheels we had into some shape of an oval and then hand, hand sanding it and polishing it. And it looked really nice. And, uh, and then we made a pretty silver setting for it. And he just, what Bob would do is he did the same thing with finding handymen to work on his house. He'd find people who would just go ahead and try something, and then he'd just wring you dry, you know? I mean, it was uh, never ending. And he got the Star Trek gig for the first film because originally they were going to have William Tice do it. And that wasn't going to work for certain reasons. And then they got Jack Bear, who was a good designer. But he was too booked. He had a lot of stuff going on. And nobody knew that Star Trek was going to do anything, you know. And so Jack Bear recommended Bob Fletcher. And his whole background was theater, opera, ballet. So he knew how bodies have to move in costumes. He knew, you know, and, and he also knew that, that what you're wearing tells the audience who you are and what you are and, you know, what kind of a Klingon you are. <laughs> and so um, it was a real education working for him because everything was so thought out. What kind of minerals the planet had and therefore any jewelry should never have certain colors or stones in it and uh, and he invented like these alphabets and 
shapes that were used. And I mean, eventually, one of the art directors invented the rest of the Klingon alphabet. But, it, you know, originally it was just Bob and mostly my partner Tom did Klingons and I did Vulcan. And, <laughs> And I have one of the drawings up here from, uh, that was the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the, the <laughs> preliminary sort of sketch. Yep. Yeah, yeah from sorry. The, from the Klingon ambassador in the whale yep. movie. I mean, uh, and uh, it's not the whale movie, it's the, uh, it's the. This uh, is the sixth one, I believe, yeah. um, Undiscovered Country. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it's the one John Shuck wore, and it was in an earlier one. Okay. But it, uh, in front of a council saying that it had done terrible things. Yeah, it was Search. in Search for Spock, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. And, and that was, to me, a total uh, theater costume, wasn't it? I mean, you know, all this braiding and the leather and the, uh, you know, the sleeves with that kind of cartridge pleating. Yep. I mean, those costumes weighed a ton. Yep. And, and luckily, Star Trek cast a lot of theater actors who really knew how to wear costumes. You know, who weren't going, wow, wow, it's hot, wow, wow, it's too heavy, or, you know, whatever. They were like, they knew what they looked like, and they knew when we were fitting um, uh, uh, for uh, uh, Christopher Lloyd for... Uh, that Klingon outfit, man, that thing was uh, made of a, a blanket. His coat was like a blanket, and it was lined in black and brown rabbit fur in chevron patterns, and it weighed a tremendous amount, and that was just his coat, not the, all the leather and the stuff underneath. And he put that thing on, and he's walking around <laughs> the fitting room, flipping it and, you know, doing turns. And then he <laughs> says, I just have to see if I, you know, can move enough to bend down and pat my beast. Yeah. You know. And, <laughs> but that's somebody who really understands that wardrobe is giving them something, mm -hmm. you know. And Bob also believed that no matter what century you're in, and that's why I object to some of the movies they make now. People are always going to adorn their bodies. You know, they're not going to want to look like everybody else. They're always going to put on something that's personal, something that's, you know, and it may start out being small thing and then that catches on and somebody else is going to want to wear this. And so, you know, it, uh, I like that theory. Um, I would like to say that the drawings that I have in here um, and the illustrations that Bob Fletcher did. Bob Fletcher was a graduate of Harvard University in their theater department. And he has about six boxes of drawings in these archives, which I've seen now three times. And it always gives me a thrill to go through them. And you can, being living here, you can have access to viewing these drawings. It's really like something to go through the entire history and see every small well, part yeah, that he you did. You can see the evolution of what a Klingon looks yeah. like. You yeah. know, because he invented the makeup. And that like never happens. Yeah. Because he's a makeup guy. And, uh, and so, but Bob was just like, nobody knew there was a Klingon in the first one, only one. And I think it was just one. And spent a fortune on that Klingon. Then they had to make more later. But, uh, <clears throat> But he just says, well, I'm going to do the head, too. And they said, but you can't design the makeup. And he said, yeah, I can't, because it has to go with the outfit. <laughs> you know, and it has to be all of a piece. So I don't want somebody else designing, you know, and I'm going to put these spines down the back, so I have to have this, like, coming off the head to justify the spines coming down the back and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, he really... Uh, he would just tell people what he was going to do, and he was very funny and had hysterical stories of prep school in the 30s and stuff. And his father was Leon Ames. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember Leon Ames, but he was a really big character actor and, uh, and, and, and very reminiscent of Fletcher in some ways. So must that? Anyway. <laughs> We have a, this is 
Sarek, the famous uh, one of Sarek and all the jewels. Can you tell us a little bit about manufacturing those resin jewels? Well, we were only making one Sarek. So we didn't, I don't think he had a double. I don't think so, thank God. Uh, <laughs> so we made, uh, first we made dummy rocks. So the sculptor could sculpt around the rock, you know, could sculpt the setting around the rock. We saw Bob did a drawing and we did like scale drawings and figured out how big and, and then we made by pour, just pouring resin and grinding the rocks. We made them out of Bondo or something like that, which Bondo glass, you know, mixing. I don't know if any of you guys are resin guys, but uh, you shouldn't do it, in, you know, but the fumes are not good, but, but you can <laughs> really make good things. And, and mixing polyester resin and Bondo is interesting because then you kind of get pourable Bondo, which sounds really nice and, you know, you can make a good stone model. So we would do that and then actually that was sculpted my, by one of my great girlfriends, Tina. And so she would then sculpt all the settings around it. And then we'd mold, make a mold of the, each of the plates because there are a bunch of different plates so it could all be attached to leather and articulate to some level and it kind of fastened off center on the shoulder. And uh, again, you know, when we fit Mark Leonard, he just had no problem with this. And that was a heavy sucker. That's a lot of rocks. And we made him beautiful rings, also great big rings, but with a breastplate like that, you don't really, you know, <laughs> seize the rings. But yeah, and then, you know, then, then you make molds of the rocks that you're casting from, and then you just pour, pour the big rocks. And that's, and uh, um, they were, they were going to do six Vulcan guards and six Vulcan vessel virgins. And uh, then they got real nervous about the budget, so they ended up four Vulcan guards. But we'd already cast all the breastplates. So I was able to keep one. And the other one, we made all clear stones and um, put our pictures behind them all. All of us that worked on it and gave it to Bob for a present. And I always had it on his wall. It was really and I would like to say, for those of you who are coming to the reception, oh, should, I have that we brought this out from LA, so you can really get a feel for it's what a, it looks like. And he it's wanted neat. it to We'll put Bob. it in the right position this time. This is, a, the, <laughs> this is the kind of thing that Bob would do, which would make you want to strangle him. Um, <laughs> he wanted it to look as though all those units are floating. Mm -hmm and not attached to the breastplate underneath. Like cabochons? No, no, in the air. Oh, in the air? <laughs> OK. No, in the air. OK. And so he said, well, you know, it can't be in the air. <laughs> There's no kind of weird non-magnet thing that, you know, will keep it just. And so what we did is when we are sculpting it, is where the bezel comes, uh, where the setting part, the gold part, comes down. We have massive undercuts, so that it's almost sitting up on a little stool, so it would still cast a shadow. Mm -hmm. You know, and he just didn't want it to look like a bunch of settings on a plate. You know, and it made it very hard to lay up the fiberglass because you're really going to get bubbles. You know, and it's just not going to be. Easier. So um, when they canceled it, I hadn't made all six helmets yet because I was the fiberglass layer upper. And uh, I was really glad I didn't have to make all six helmets because <coughs> those were awful. They're open work, you know, helmets. I don't know if you guys remember them, but they were beautiful. So now we have the, this is uh, Fletcher's illustration of Khan. Up here, I'm early, concept. early con so these are the early concept photos of Khan, and you really got a kick out of Ricardo Montalban. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I love this drawing, though. It's pretty good. And then here oh, he is, Ricardo Montalban, in this fine wanted, Corinthian leather. You show those facts. <laughs> yeah, no. You might, 
if you're that age and you've got those pecs, you know, you got to flaunt it. Yep. And he had pecs for yes, sure. Absolutely. Lots of people thought they were fake pecs. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, somebody just asked me yesterday, those are fake pecs, right? Yeah. I said, no, no, he had the pecs. No. So this is the Star Trek, you know, the famous con jewelry when uh, the ship was, um, all the, the cadets and the crew were killed. When I was doing my research, it was very similar to some tribes in New Guinea where they would kill, you know, their, their attackers, their enemies, and then, you know, you do the headhunters or you wear whatever around. And same thing kind of went on the ship. It became that trophy for, well, for Khan. It, it was real serious <laughs> that he wanted, he wanted any fabric to look like it was in the seats, you know, that everything should, because when that Botany Bay crash, Mm -hmm. You know, then there's, it's really like castaway. Whatever have you got, that's all you've got. So if you're going to adorn yourself with jewelry, which Bob always felt everyone would, you're going to make it out of circuitry and bits and a broken Federation buckle, you know. Okay, we have Worf and Dax. The famous wedding jewelry of Worf and Dax. It was good. It was good. Now, we, <laughs> now we have another designer. And so we you know, through a lot of different designers, through the features, and um, the very beginning of the first series, uh, Next Generation, had a, had a couple of different designers right at the outset. And then they got Bob Blackman, who's very good, very good. And uh, he also had come from theater. That's where my friend Tina knew him from doing Midsummer Night's Dream somewhere, you know. And, uh, and so by this time, we'd gotten used to how each other works. And TV schedule, of course, really sucks because most of the time you have a week. And the good designer will get the script and get it to whatever workroom is going to do it ASAP. And, uh, but this, this one and one other of the Star Trek ex, uh, uh, episodes was a two, week, a two week prep. And it had to be because we had to make all of Worf's jewelry, all of Dax's jewelry, and there was an efficient, you know, somebody who, had, the one who performs the wedding, and somebody else, I don't remember what she was. And it all, and they all had a lot of parts. And um, so Bob Blackman would just give me like a little pen sketch, and then he would just say, jewelry here, jewelry here, jewelry here, jewelry here. <laughs> and, and, well, it's nice when you trust people and you can, you know, and, and it's rare. I mean, I have a lot of designer people, customers that they just have to see a sample, and I said, how does that work if you have a week and a half for the whole thing? If it takes me a week to make it, and you say, well, gee, maybe I want it a little smaller. We're out of time. I'm just like, oh, gee, I'm sorry. So, you know, we should decide, or we should just not do this. But Bob would, you know, I'd say, I'm going to lay out a bunch of parts and sort of pretend that this is going to be a necklace. And he would just come over and go, yeah, fine. You know? <laughs> and um, I said with that, with the big epaulette that Worf has. I said, it sort of looks like the Chrysler building lying down. <laughs> you know, I don't know if it's going to work, but, you know, I, and, uh, you know, because it was before you could take a little snap and, you know, I'd have to somehow put it in the Xerox machine and, you know, it, 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 those days. But, but, you know, he has a baldric, he has a necklace, he's got the belt, he's got the things on his arm, and we had to do different ones. We couldn't just use the ones they always wore. And so they were all sculpted for that show. They weren't like, oh, Cleons from the past or something. These were all um, done specifically for that. And then we get to the crowns, and I said to Blackman, look, he wears a prosthetic head. And so to make a crown that fits him, I pretty much have to have the head, you know, <laughs> which I'm sure the makeup department has. But 
it's the head itself, once he's in that makeup, it's squishy. So if I put a rigid crown on it, it's just going to look terrible because it's going to look like it's denting his head. <laughs> and so we came up with this idea of <coughs> making like a quarter, just found metal object parts, just going around the shop making a box of stuff, you know, bench stuff, and solder them together and making little units about, you know, an inch and a half to two inches by half an inch. And then some of them were quickie sculptures and we cast them in uh, pewter and drop a little resin in them. And then there was some more that were made of plastic and they were gold leafed. And, and then they were, could all attach to a, uh, sorry about that, to a, uh, a leather band. And that way it would sit gently on his head and you can arrange them differently for Dax's head. And it would look, you know, real pretty. So we were glad that worked out. <gasps> Air break! Air break! Sorry, I just jumped in. Um, hi Maggie, this is a wonderful talk. Is this a wonderful talk? <laughs> There's actually some, the, the mayor sends his regrets, Mayor Joe Pernatone, uh, can't be here, but uh, we have a, uh, a special award here from Gregory Jenkins, director of some of the lights. Thanks for being here today. You want a microphone? Ah, oh, what if it's you? So hello, hello. Oops. Is it on? Yeah. So uh, yes, as Laura said, I'm Gregory Jenkins. I, am, I work for the mayor, and the mayor sends his regrets, but wanted me to come over and uh, send some support to you all. Thanks a lot for coming to Somerville, if you aren't from Somerville. Uh, thanks again for uh, supporting, obviously, the Artists' Cell. And this is you know, their event, their fundraiser, their ability to support artists and makers in the community. It's a pretty amazing thing. Um, Somerville likes to think of itself as being supportive of the arts community, the maker community. We, we try our best. Sometimes you know, we may fall a little short, but we are doing pretty well as a community. Amazing. It's an amazing community. Um, you guys have all, everybody here has been, you know, amazing. The Armory here, this is, the Armory is our host. This was a, a nice little battle too back in 2004, I think, uh, when it used to be a, you know, a physical Armory and we sort of were able to advocate and was able to, you know, create a beautiful space here. There's beautiful spaces all across the city, but the spaces too aren't, nearly as important as the people. So we did put together this proclamation, and this is on behalf of Mayor Joseph A. Curtitone. So whereas the city of Somerville's values has made a commitment to fostering the arts, creativity, and making as essential to human and community well-being, whereas the Artist Asylum is recognized internationally as a center for artistic and innovation excellence for making in Somerville, including a place to explore jewelry, prop making, and obviously a lot of other things. Whereas Maggie Schbach oh. is a preeminent jeweler <laughs> and metal worker to the silver screen fashion runways into Star Trek universe and is an inspiration to generations of do-it-yourself makers for creativity, tenacity, resiliency, technique, and collaborative skills. <laughs> Whereas the artist asylum has beamed down the renowned Star Trek pop <laughs> and jewelry maker Margaret Maggie Schbach from Hollywood to Somerville to share her story, insights, and artistry, designing and fabricating the adornment of a universe loved by millions of people around the world, whereas the Artist Asylum will celebrate Maggie's achievement with a public talk, as it is here, an interstellar reception, which is coming up, I hear, a raffle, online auction, and a jewelry casting workshop to benefit the Artist Asylum. And whereas the city of Somerville Maggie Schwach and the Artist Asylum share in their passions to promote and support hands-on artists and makers, entrepreneurship, appreciation of the arts, and imagining new works and worlds by encouraging creativity and exploration. Therefore, I, Joseph Curtitone, or Gregory Jenkins, <laughs> on his behalf, Mayor of Somerville, do hereby complain, proclaim Sunday, September 22nd, 2019, to be Maggie Schwach, boldly go forth and create day. Yay! 
And in the city of Somerville, I urge all of my fellow Somervillians to join me in celebrating this accomplishment and impact to our city. Thank you. There's your proclamation. Oh, aren't you <laughs> wow. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Well, I have no words. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I, um, I don't know that there's anything like this in L.A. <laughs> no. The artist in the asylum thing, when I walked through that building for the first time the other day, I'm just stunned that of the, and, and the, the other one too, the... Uh, Western the, Avenue Studios, yeah, from my studios, there's yeah. Like, there's, there's people making clothes, and Lola, yeah. there's bindaries, there's people taking motorcycles apart. There's, you know, it's just so great. I honestly haven't seen anything like it in LA since we were hippies. <laughs> you know, and people did shit like that all the time. And so, but, but there was never an organized place to do it. And I think of the amount of people I know who are terrifically creative, but they can't afford a place to do it. And um, when, when we were just starting out, my husband Tom and I, um, we could afford to rent in, in LA a $90 a month house, house, because it had a garage so he could weld out there and, and another room so he could paint and draw. You could not get, and it was in a crummy area, but it didn't matter, you paint the walls, you learn how to sand floors, you know, but, they don't have that anymore. The crummiest house, you know, just costs an arm and a leg anymore to rent. And, and so to, if, if people had had this, what you guys have here is just treasure it, please. And just, you know, participate in making things in it. And if you're just interested in it, then contribute money to it. Because, wow, you know, it's one of those, you don't know what you got till it's gone. And if it goes away, you're gonna say, well, how could we be so dumb to let it go away? <laughs> you know, you must really support it because it's beautiful to see, to walk through there. It's really beautiful. Yay. Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> We uh, have everybody's attention here. Um, one of the things that I've learned um, from Karen and, and then from others on our team here is that um, this hippie vibe you were talking about, it still sort of exists in this place called Burning Man, right? Yes. That's what I've heard. I haven't been. How many people here are burners? And, Yay. and you go, holy, holy Toledo. <laughs> holy wow, cow. This side is there's a lot. <laughs> this side, not so many. Yeah. But mix and mingle. Okay. Um, but one of the things that I've learned last night, in fact, I was instructed a little bit on this, but Generosity is a big um, feature. Gifting. Of gifting. Gifting. Gifting is a big part. Would you like to uh, talk for 30 seconds about gifting? Sure. And Oop. our group here? Sure. Oh, I've, I've got a mic, so I'm good. Okay. So, yeah, gifting. It's, uh, gifting is something that I really started to understand in the playa at Burning Man for my first project was to make a little pendant that we put a little bit of in resin inlay. And for the burners who you know, this, you know, we didn't, we're in a theme camp. We were hawking people off the street to go, come and, come and make a thing. And then they come run in, they make it, they run back to their camp. They go, can I bring my camp? <laughs> and I'm like, sure. And our, we made more and we made more. And so we make these little theme-related bronze pendants, which the whole thing turned into a book, which turned into now eight museum exhibitions. The cool thing is that I heard this year from, from Burning Man that jewelry has just blown up. People are making and gifting, and all exchanges are going around. So, should I? You want to make the answer? So, we thought it would be fun to gift you something. Look under your seats. Got nothing. Some of you got something. Some got some, some got nothing. That's the way of Burning Man. Not everybody gets everything, right? <laughs> what you have. All right, who got one? Has anyone found something? What have Does we anybody got? find something? Yep, yep, great, great. So what you have in your hands, it's something called the Catan Probe. There was a wonderful 
episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called Inner Light. It's when Picard was um, sort of hit by this probe that was wandering around in space and he collapsed and he was struck. He literally lived in another lifetime through the storytelling of this, this, uh, of, of this other life that was all the memories were stored in the little Catan probe. And he was struggling, trying to get kind of like, where am I? I'm trying to do things. And it's where he learned to play the flute. And those little pendants are actually the remake of one of the fans of the Catan probe. I am happy to say we have more over at the receptions. So please come and we've got, we, I, got a, brought a, I brought a bunch more for folks too. So, so we please enjoy. We've got a little necklace for you too, a to, little thing to put it on. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Yes. And okay. again, oh, sorry, I was going to say, and again, um, a huge thanks to all of you for showing up, um, being a part of this really special conversation. And I look forward to seeing you <coughs> later yep. for the reception, six o'clock. Yep. Okay, so we're going to move on. Uh, Maggie Spock, I found, I didn't even know this when I first met Maggie Spock. But Maggie Spock, this is the Kolinar necklace. It's the Kolinar pendant. This is like one of the seminal, most fantastic pendants that were, for me, that really kind of represented the the really hallmark of, of what Star Trek was all about. Maggie made this. She was in the draw, she did the drawings here with um, Robert Fletcher. I visited Maggie several times now over at her shop and about the third time she opens up this little folder and she said, oh yeah, there's this drawing that I did of the Colinar necklace and I'm like, oh. <laughs> whoa, okay, we're gonna go and take a whole bunch of these drawings and I'm gonna get them like scanned immediately and then we had them professionally photographed and then they're tucked away. And We have a whole bunch of these in prints that we've done copies with, Maggie had signed them. So another reason to come to this great reception we're having tonight. So Maggie, if you could tell us a little bit about, I have the drawing up, so you can tell us a little bit about the drawing and then how you two worked it worked out the the concept of the Colinar pendant. He, uh, Bob wasn't <clears throat> sure what he would. That scene had a bunch of priests and the priestess, and so there was an awful lot of design going on on that one that one little short scene. And he um, wasn't sure what it was supposed to be, but he said, "Fool around and draw some stuff," and then. We'll talk about it. So, but he told me kind of the shape he wanted. It had to be, because this really was the first time I did any Vulcan, you know, that <clears throat> there, there wasn't. And so I sort of tried to do it asymmetrically, the way he's talking, and I'm kind of really symmetrical. So it's hard to shift to, mm, no, tilt at this, and don't make, this one the same as that one and move that over and then he would just come and say okay but I want to, it can't just be flat it has to be beveled and I really want to see that uh, resin has movement inside it that it's not just a piece of plexiglass which it's not it's very thin but when you held it up to the light it, there was a lot of stuff going around <coughs> You know, I would start pouring it, and then before it gels, I'd pour some darker red in, and then I'd pour a little blue in. And, you know, you have a lot of waste. Karen can tell you, I've got shoe boxes and cartons full of Vulcan resin, parts. <laughs> resin parts. parts. Yeah. You know, rocks that didn't come out quite the right color jade or didn't come out quite right, because that's why it's kind of a pain in the to make doubles, you know, where something has to absolutely match. And the thing with this is he had to drop it. And those two crystals, quote unquote, on the left, were just resin, poured resin, not, I mean, plexiglass is stronger. And they were just poured resin. So, you know, they're very brittle. Mm -hmm. And they put a pillow on the ground, <laughs> but it would miss the pillow or bounce. <laughs> And every time it would come up, they would break. 
And so I just had to make a whole lot of them. And the key customer on the set had a file. And he would just file the whole thing out and glue the new ones in. So I made like, I only had to make one necklace, but I made like six or eight of the little hanging down crystals. You know, but it really looked pretty. And then the chain, he just said, make chain that doesn't look like it came from a store, you know. So the shop had been in existence since the 30s. And the guy who owned it before us had a lot of weird old beads and stuff. So I would find a couple of beads and say, OK, I'll put those on. I had some old necklace that I wasn't going to wear anymore. So part of it is that, that, that. You know, so it just doesn't look like you went and bought a rope chain or a curb chain and put it on it. Like, you know, somebody down the block has it on their bracelet, you know. We have the, um, the, oh, the United, United Federation pin, yeah. which you used to call, which you call United the... United Federation, uh, United Flying Potato. <laughs> <laughs> this was, I felt, not one of Bob's best ideas. <laughs> I just, you know, that was a, another thing where he had a lot on his plate because it was that kind of un -y kind of scene. And uh, so he had like all these aliens in the scene and then plus he had like something like 40 flagship officers, that flag rank officers. And usually it was just the ones that maybe, you know, the, Trek, the, the, the Star Trek cast and one other ship's worth. But this, they all had to be, you know, commander and above and, you know, and so I always felt this got by him, you know, that there should have been something else for the UFP. But this is what we ended up with. And uh, the, you can see all the color samples of the paint, trying to get the paint color right on it, saying, is this going to work, Bob? I mean, and this was, I think, when it was going to be white, which really would have been bad because it's so big. And, and it really would have looked dumb if it was white, I think. It, was, it ended up being sort of, sort of a weird candy apple blue. Oops, sorry, whoa, whoa, sorry, sorry. Back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. My apologies. Okay, so this is the original mold from casting. You can see it here on the screen a little bit. Oh, yes. Maggie? Oh, yeah. I've got yeah, a, yeah, yeah. I have it on the screen. So, in other words, the. The ones in the middle, I make a photo, I do the art, and then I go to a photo etcher um, who, in, a, in effect, prints it on a magnesium plate. And you tell them the depth of etch you want, how deep it's going to get etched, and the finished dimensions. And you tell them that it's supposed to read right, and uh, that the black parts are raised, you know, in your art. And then it comes out. And then, and so the UFP and the potato part are, <laughs> are um, photo etched plates. And then you make a mold of them. And from there, you can either just cast right from it if it doesn't have to have anything done to it. Or you, make, uh, you can pour wax in that mold and you can sculpt on it and add stuff to it if it needs that. But this was just a straight. That's like an almost seven foot tall cabinet. And the drawers are about this wide, and it's a deep. And there's lots of drawers. And they have nothing in them but metal badge patterns. So you don't want to have to be moving my shop too much. Because all this, I mean, working on beautiful things for very talented designers is wonderful. But what keeps me alive is making police badges for movies and TV, and, uh, and I like to think there's a lot of art involved in police badges. You know, you have to get the drawing in the center of whatever, I mean, it's amazing how many useless information I know about people's state seals. <laughs> um, so I wanted to address a little bit about the different way that you solder, because well, traditionally actually, we're like it's torches. it's a real old way. And you know, it's how I learned, and so you know, you just, well, 
I've tried to do it with, I've got a torch, I use the torch, but it's not one of these nifty little ones. Mine's um, oxygen and city gas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's a big tank and it's got sort of heavy hoses. But um, we, the, I mean, we make our own soldering irons and we have a gas ring next to where we sit and heat them up. Your iron is on the fire. And uh, so it's got a wooden handle. Some of them come from old files or something like that. And then a lot of worn out old um, square or round rasps, you know, who've lost its, <coughs> all its teeth. And then you take a copper rod and drill a larger hole on one and a slightly smaller taper the hole, bang it down onto the, uh, onto the shaft of this old file and then you braze it on, <clears throat> and then you can go over the belt sander and make the, make the tip any point you want. And so it's nice, because it can be a big flat one if you want to, you know, cover, tin a big area or something, it'll just flow right on, or you can make it real super small and pointy. And I don't know, I, it's just the way we've always done it. I'm, I'm advocating that when you ever retire, but I think the Smithsonian should just adopt her <laughs> studio, right? My I mean, what an incredible, knows. incredible thing it would be if Julia Childs can have her kitchen. I think we should have Maggie Schbach's studio in there watching everything. What's always impressed me about meeting when I had multiple, about five visits over to her studio, is that I have to remember that she's doing things, you know, there's no computer. There's no 3D, there's no 3D printer, there's no CAD, there's no, there's none of this. I mean, it's just you with this process. I don't even have a cell phone. No, she doesn't even have a cell phone. <laughs> Believe me, I, you know, I have to have a carrier pigeon around. <laughs> That's the only way we can communicate. But um, it's, it, it strikes me when I sit down at my studio and even over, you know, the one, one over at Artisans and all the amazing tools that we have over there yeah, that you have to sit there and point. like, yeah, and you just have to sit there and think, okay, I don't have any of this. I have to really reach in. She doesn't have to reach because she doesn't know what's out there, but you just, you look around everything that's sitting around you going, okay, I have to make this thing and okay, there's that thing and I can use that piece of metal and I know how to do that little technique. And yet here we have this incredible amount of just enduring jewelry from many yeah. movies and many TV shows. The other thing about doing prop jewelry that really struck me is that you have to do a lot of this in a week. <laughs> and you have to always be sure you find out, it, are they going to fight in it? Oh, yeah, um, okay. Does it have to be in the water? That, you know, there's things, where questions, it's, it's a total earn while you learn thing, when you don't ask. And all of a sudden, they say your TR broke. And this happened on a Bette Miller movie called For the Boys. And I made her this, um, it was, she was supposed to be a, you know, like an act, entertaining mm -hmm. the troops. And, and it was supposed to be like a little Persian rhinestone thing. And I made a real simple little curly PR thing. And, and then they came and they said they broke it. And I said, why, wow, how? You know, I mean, this is like, how? You could throw this down, it wouldn't break. Oh, she was fighting with it. You know, and the, they added this scene. <laughs> they fight. I said, you know, if you'd have just ordered two, I'm, I'm making them side by side. It's, it's very easy. But now to go back and try to figure out what I did, you know, that's the thing. If you make stuff really fast, and then if you do have to duplicate it, you just have no idea what you did. <laughs> And the thing is, which is really important, that you don't know, what you have to be able to do is, because there's no, no way you can turn back, not enough time. You, you gotta figure out right away, am I gonna cast this? Am I gonna bash this out? Am I gonna, you know, what method am I gonna use to make it? Because if you start down the casting road, making molds and doing all that, you are going to run out of time if they, if all of a sudden you realize, gee, I should have just formed this, I should have sought it out. And, uh, you know, so 
you have to be able to work lots of different ways in order to sort of shoehorn it into their crazy schedules. Do you have a favorite piece of jewelry you made? A piece of jewelry. You know, you have some things that you're very proud of. What, what I was most impressed that we pulled off so well was not Princess Mia's tiara in um, Princess Diaries, but the coronation crown in the second one, which was really cool looking because I didn't just put it on a solid band. I made an actual how it's supposed to look, which is do the whole thing in heavy wire work and then put the rhinestone stuff on the wire so you can see the red velvet cap through the band. And then Tom sculpted, you know how on the uh, British crown there's a cluster that has mm -hmm. leeks and shamrocks and you know the, the, the flowers that symbolize and the Tudor rose and all that. Well, this one was all pears and pear blossoms because it, Genovia is pears. And uh, so it looked, if you squinted, you would have thought it was like British crown, except there was all these pears. And then the parts that screw on up here, the, the top, instead of an orb with a cross on it, it was a beautiful pear that was all done like in transparent yellow enamel. It was really pretty, worked out great. I mean, it's nice when something really, you just go, yes. <laughs> so, we all had that moment. Yeah. <laughs> so I understand you're a member of the Sherlockian Society and you oh. made a fantastic steampunk outfit, which oh, yeah. I have. Could you tell us a little bit about yeah. your incredible outfit here? Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> I, be, I was into Sherlock since I was about 12. That, you know, a lot of us get hit by it right around in that, that age, somehow if it catches you at the right age. And uh, my mom used to subscribe to the Saturday Review, which was um, published and owned by Christopher Morley, who was a founding Sherlockian of the Baker Street Irregulars, which is the group in New York. And it's an older group than the London Society. So, uh, you know, I, my whole dream was that, oh my God, someday, someday I could go to the Baker Street Irregulars dinner and how that would be. And um, I didn't, I'm glad I didn't know that up through really the late 70s, they didn't let any women go home. That would have just broken my heart. But I, we have our own <clears throat> Sherlock Holmes Society in LA. Actually, there are several. Uh, and we uh, put on a gas fitters ball every year in a building similar to this, except like a quarter of it, you know. And uh, so one year, the powers that be, we all got together and we were like, what are we going to do for the ball? And they said, well, we're going to, we want to have a steampunk ball. And I said, why? Sherlock isn't, it's not like Jules Verne. It's not, you know, it's not really steampunk. And well, but it's fun, and everybody likes to. <laughs> you talk about making outfits. We, we had a, um, a steampunk uh, festival of workmen at, at a friend's house where you could bring a bunch of parts. You could go get your super soaker at the you know, toy store, and you could bring a trash can, and you could bring whatever you wanted, and we would help you turn it into some weird costume part. Cool. We had hot glue guns, pop rivets, cool. you know, just, and lots of kinds of paint. And it was a great day. I mean, all these people who didn't do art at all were just having a total ball doing this. And so I knew that if I came in a corset and goggles and a top hat, they all know what I do for a living, and they would mock me. And so... <laughs> So I, I started, I thought, okay, you know, I could make it out of clay. And then I thought, no, you know, I can't make the headdress out of clay. I can't make cups out of clay. I, you know, I just don't want to lay up the resin. And then I, then I got to have it metalized, and that's a big hassle. So I thought, okay, I'm going to make it out of metal. So I started with the chest, the bodice kind of. And that actually worked out okay. I made a metal frame, and then I just started making... It's hard to make something on yourself, though, you know? Mm -hmm. 
um, and I don't have any, you know, dress forms and things at the shop. So I just kept hammering it and making, putting little rivets in it and going around and around and around. And then I made the headdress. I was real excited about the headdress. The head I keep it on is the head of the wonderful actress Tandy Newton. And I had to make her uh, headdresses for Chronicles of Riddick. And I saved her head because it just looked so pretty <laughs> wearing things. I have Meryl Streep's head up there too. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, yeah, I, it, that was just a real fun project. Because obviously I know it every year it's in, it's in November. So it starts sometime in the summer, so I didn't have to hurry, and I just kept whanging away at it. And uh, it was about seven years after I started going to the gym, so I was about 67. And I actually went out and bought a gold bodysuit, which I thought was radically brave of somebody <laughs> who's 67 years old. And I had a girlfriend who made a real, uh, you know, like metallic lace, sticky out, almost tutu thing, with a huge bow in the back. And it looked like it was made of metal. And my husband went out and found me at thrift shops some real hooker boots, because I want to be really tall. And, uh, and they were too small for me. But I figured, and I get them painted by my girlfriend, who's a textile artist in Dyer. And then I can wear them like up to the Grand March. I can do that. And then I can go upstairs and put pump, gold pumps on. You know, but at least I'll have them for the beginning <laughs> for making a, an impression. And the only thing Oops, I did sorry. that was weird was that in the, it had to have something Sherlockian. So there's this dial in the stomach. And there's a, a story where there's an assassination attempt on Holmes. It's called The Empty House. And... Uh, uh, it's, he, made by a gun, made by a blind German guy uh, named Von Herder. So <clears throat> I made this dial and I wrote, Von Herder, you know the way watches have writing on them, Von Herder, Druckluftwerks, Berlin, Paris, London. We, my husband spoke a little German and figured, that's sort of like compressed air, I mean, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so that was, I had to have something Holmesian about it. Well, that was that. That was just fun. So we're just showing a few. This is your trusty bench oh, pin. My bench pin. You're showing all my ancient tools. I know, I love these, though. I mean, it's like, I love this. It's a good old bench pin. <coughs> the blades. The, the blades. blades. <laughs> ah, okay, so now we're down to the big, some of oh, the things just, in her. I love looking at this. This one yeah, just, one oh, hutch is just it's just you know fun really cool stuff. really fun stuff and really because I make stuff for movies I don't get them back so most of this stuff is stuff I made for myself for that gas fitters ball <laughs> and uh, at various times you know and some of it well we can go into this one yeah, here yeah. and I'm going to try and point okay, this to the, you. Uh, the turquoise things were from Moonlighting, and um, Sybil Shepherd had to have uh, triple sets for that episode because there were stunts. And Mother Nature doesn't make uh, triple nuggets. So we had to make the stones, you know, so she had a buckle, two conchos, um, a pair of earrings, and a bracelet. And so I had to make three of each thing, and the only way to do it so they would all look the same was to the old resin rock trick and uh, make it out of, so that way at least you can ask the designer, here's an old copy of Arizona Highways, pick out any color of turquoise that you want, <laughs> you know? I mean, because it can be really green and really intense blue, or it can be very, you know, light. So. You told this great story about Sybil Shepherd in the last picture show where she was wearing... Either no, it wasn't some, the last oh, it was picture, picture show, show, was it? No, 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 no. It was in Moonlighting. Oh, okay. um, oh, Moonlighting, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, she was difficult to work with, apparently. Um, she would, they would, they would schedule her to shoot, you know, they have a Christmas break. 
and the designer, who's a wonderful guy who's passed away. I miss him every day, Robert Turteries. I have good luck with designers named Robert. Yeah, you do. You anybody do. named Robert, my husband's Robert. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but Turteries would tell the production manager, do not schedule her for the first shot back because she's going home to the south and she's going to have eaten for, you know, two weeks and nothing will fit her. <laughs> so I need, just tell me what scene you're gonna shoot first and I will be ready to alter it by noon. You know, it will be done, but she cannot shoot the first where, you know, when she comes back. And, and I mean, that was just, she, she would gain weight and they would make big, and they would make the chairs bigger. <laughs> so she would seem smaller. And he would make big purses. And, uh, and at one point, she was wearing some hip drape thing. And I'd made a brooch that went on the hip that was all amethyst and really cool. And, uh, and then Terry brought it back and he said, can you make this like about an inch bigger all the way around? <laughs> <laughs> but that, it, it's like a scale thing, you know? If you want to be smaller, well, okay. You got all this little ditzy stuff. So this, I didn't know this existed. This is the Nazi drawer because there are the movies half, with Nazis in them. The other yeah. half of it is Imperial Church. Yeah. And this part is the. Yeah. And I have the same drawer for Russia. You know, further up on the thing though. Yeah. Soviet Russia, and I'm gonna don't have much in terms of the new Russia. And it's got a lot of Soviet stuff. So this is some of the, her, she has this, but three big cases oh, yeah. of police badges on her wall, so. You know, people don't, just, they don't know you can do it unless they can see it. So, uh, you know, I just have these cases and I put them up and I'll rotate some of them out. And one of them is fairly accurate and completely full federal stuff. And, you know, another one is like all made up stuff. And then this one's mostly pretty real, uh, except for like the, the seven-pointed star is the CSI star. And so it says the wrong words, you know, because it, they have to be lettered differently. And above it is Jack Bauer's TTU badge. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, the Kentucky badges are from Justified. You know, just X Files. She made the X Files badge. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. FBI badges. You know, and and then some of them say, "Well, how they're so everybody's so afraid of the legal departments now." And I'm like, you know, that if somebody came to your house, and you guys, okay, you know what your boss, your Boston or your Lawrence or whatever it is, police. I've made Lawrence badges looks like, I don't know if you could draw it, but if somebody showed up in your house and said, DEA, and they had a windbreaker on that says DEA, which you can get, and they had a badge, would you know it was fake? No, not at all. I mean, yeah. you know, you wouldn't. And, and so that's always a kind of a scary thing, and you know, that's why I don't, I have no sign on my building and I never advertise. 48 years, no ads. And, and it, you know, it's just all word of mouth. But it, it's really like, I love people, and I don't really want them for customers. I mean, I, you know, it, it's, it's hard. Uh, when I, when, I mean, I've had gals figure out that I made the Princess Mia tiaras, and they really want me to make them for their wedding or something. And it's, people are much harder to please than costume designers are. And I really think it's because they think if they put this TR on, they're going to look like Anne Hathaway. <laughs> and there's, and, it, and you know, it's not a bad thing. Everybody, you know, you don't want to think if you put on a, you know, Picard outfit, you know, you, you want to, you just don't look in the mirror. You just have the feeling and it's great, you know, don't, don't mess with it, just enjoy it. And these, by the way, are not enameled. They're all hand painted. Well, I, yeah, I paint with, with enamel paint. With lacquer. Yeah. Because lacquer relieves so nice. 
so whatever gets where it's not supposed to be just wipes really clean. <clears throat> and then I, uh, and then I put uh, uh, epoxy, uh, an epoxy coating that most people use for bar tops and uh, doing that kind of thing. Um, and it's cool stuff, but boy, the mix has to be exactly right or it's just yep. sticky forever. And that's just so depressing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, it's beautiful because it, it doesn't sink. You know, some varnishes or stuff, as it cures, it sinks. Mm -hmm. And this stuff stays really lovely. Really lovely, yeah. yeah. So I had called Maggie on the phone one day and she said, Oh, I'm busy working on Madam's yeah, secretary. This is Madam's secretary. Secret and service pins for Madam's well, secretary. <laughs> I have 120. Guys, do they have? <laughs> and after I sent out this order, they called and, and ordered 40 more. Yeah. 40 more. That was really pretty cool. So we're kind of winding down to the end. I, this is not something made by Maggie. This is the IDIC pin, which stands for Infinite Diversity, Infinite Combinations that Spock wore in the original series. And I wanted to show you a little bit today. This was a fan-produced uh, fan produced pin, um, but it also just sort of shows not only what Maggie does, but the kind of spirit and, and the camaraderie that we all, that a lot of the fans are, get so excited to really produce high quality jewelry. This was made, casted uh, down in Rhode Island at Race Car Jewelry in Pawtucket. And my friend Ryan Norbauer, who's been to your studio many times, yes. he's a great guy yes. and a very big Trekkie and it was really good. So, so before we get to the, um, what we'd like to do open now is to some Q&A. And I'm sure you probably, after hearing all this, must have questions. So we have a microphone we're going to bring to this nice gentleman here. Margaret, right here. Uh, thank you for such a great talk. Um, how does it work with the difference between props and costumes with your work? Because I know in Hollywood sometimes people get very proprietary yeah, it's about... it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, uh, wardrobe does jewelry unless it's mentioned in, in the script. If, if, uh, if it's a bracelet and it gets stolen, you know, and there's plot points about it, it's a prop. If the, you know, but prop guys most frequently are the ones that order rings. I mean, the Johnny Depp rings that we do for Pirates of the Caribbean, that's the prop guy. Order had nothing to do with it. Um, it's really like, I don't know whether it's like a macho thing with the rings. They most of the time wouldn't touch a necklace. They wouldn't, you know, but yeah, it's it's it is kind of weird. It's almost the same thing with badges. Like wardrobe is supposed to provide the breast badge, and and uh, and, uh, and props is supposed to cap or something like that. And obviously that's dumb. But <laughs> it, but yeah, with with jewelry, it all depends technically on how how, how it's used. If, if if you're making a necklace to go with a fabulous gown, it's wardrobe. If you're making a necklace because it's the something or other necklace and it's mentioned in the script and somebody tears it off or something, then it's a prop, pretty much. Anybody else? Uh, we've got one here and then one in the back, so we'll take that one there. Uh, thanks also for, that was such a great talk. I enjoyed it too, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned um, working on early um, Klingon and Vulcan script during the motion picture and you mentioned that you worked on some of the Vulcan, and obviously Vulcan calligraphy got kind of more developed over the movies and seasons, yeah. and I was just wondering if you would talk a little bit more about early Vulcan yeah. script in your part. It, it, was, it was fun, and um, on the, uh, for instance, on the uh, search for Spock, there was a scene at the end where they're going back to bring him, the two bodies back, to McCoy and Spock, and try to uni reunite them. And there's a scene there that's missing that was cut. And it was, and I really think it was a mistake, because they shot it. It's not like they, 
And uh, it was all these people, all these Vulcans, w welcoming him back to, you know, his body back. And it was a beautiful, big ceremonial thing. And they all had to have these hats that had a cartouche on it with Vulcan, some Vulcan, whatever you want to call it, letter. It's not so much letters as symbol. And uh, like a pictogram or something more than an actual letter. And so uh, there were like hundreds. There was baby Vulcans. It was so dear, you know, in the little hats with the little things and the ears coming up, and mommy Vulcans in beautiful costumes that you could wear. I mean, because they had to make costumes that were uh, mix and match. You know, it sort of be a tunic top and pants and a thing and all these wonderful <clears throat> fabric. And so, you know, there was no way we were going to, like, I had like seven people working on these things. And we couldn't do them the way we do Spocks because there were too many. So I just cast a bunch of black ones, a bunch of red ones, a bunch of whatever, you know, ones, and then clean them all up. And then they would paint the edge black. And then they would paint a gold letter in the middle. And I would try to show them the way you make a Vulcan letter. Which is, I mean, one of the ones on Mr. Spock's robe looks a lot like a five, you know. And what that has is it's got some straight line parts, and then all of a sudden it goes curly. And then it has another straight line, and then it curls. You know, that's the way you invent Vulcan letters. One of our gals who was working with us at that point was Chinese. She had the hardest time trying to figure out how to make the Vulcan letters, because it wasn't you know, natural to any, uh, but, you know, some people really could get the hang of how you, invent. and one time I invented a great Vulcan letter that I was just really proud of, and we were going to put on something, and I realized it looked almost exactly like the GM logo. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. So, well, you just have to, yeah. you know, and it's like that thing, I don't know how many of you guys are actually sculptors, but my partner always had this absolute thing that you have to be so careful when you're sculpting something because it might have a face in it. Mm -hmm. And he always made me walk across the room and look at it and say, that's a face. You can see that face. There's the eyes, and the grill is the mouth, and, you know, there's a face in there. We've got to change it. And, you know, that kind of stuff is really true. It's so easy for it to happen. You know, you know, look at it the same way. That's what it looks like. We had another one over here. Right here. You're standing right in front of her. <laughs> Two parts. Um, first, it's great to hear how you went about the work. And I always kind of thought, and now especially when I hear that it was like things were turned over in a week, I kind of thought that the jewelry pieces were made out of prop materials too. I never had thought they were metal. Oh. Like, the, like the large one with the, lar the standing man with the whole plate, that was metal? No, no, no. Sarek, uh, Sarek stuff the whole fiber shield. Glass. Okay, yeah, I was... Okay. Fiberglass, so, right. fiberglass with resin rocks yeah. attached to uh, leather. Okay, so there's a mix. Whatever yeah. materials work the best, fastest... For the ideas. I mean, there was a lot of metal jewelry made, all the bracelets and um, rings. And but there was alternative materials, let's say, were, also. Were metal and, you know, usually brass. I mean, okay. we like to work in brass. And then I didn't hear quite how you transit. Like, I heard you were making costumes. Well, you were acting and then making costumes, and then the director was like, hey, you can... How did you transition... I know makers make a lot of different things in a lot of different fields, but how did you go from the costume to the jewelry? Well, because the shop was inside that building. And I was trying to figure out a way for my husband to be happy. <laughs> and I thought, you know, he's a metal sculptor, so what could go wrong? <laughs> and, uh, so he was in the metals and then kind of... And, and then, you know, it dawned on me in a year or so that I was actually going to have to learn how to do this. 
And, it, you know, at first I'd just make little things and, um, and then I got so I was feeling good, you know, and then people like Bob Fletcher come along and give you amazing challenges and you just have to, it's still today, um, I don't know what's coming in and I don't know if I'm going to know how to make it. But my thing is, I have to figure it out <laughs> or turn it down right then. Whatever you do, do not take a job and not finish it. Yep. You know, I mean, that's, I think, I, customers will come back to me in a minute if I tell them, I can't do it, you don't have enough time, or whatever the reason is, or I, you know, it's some prop where you push a button and something opens and it's a special effect prop and I don't make those. And, uh, and they'll appreciate you much more if you tell them and maybe refer them. And there's, I think people who don't refer customers are crazy. You know, I don't do it, but so-and-so does it. And, you know, they'll remember that you helped them out because they're in a bind because they got to have it. Any other questions? Uh, got one here, then there. I'm interested in the intersection between your own originality and your own interest in jewelry from different eras and different um, countries. Um, tell me about your own interests of what you like to research, what you like to visit, and what you like to study. Like, what's oh, in your brain that sort of suddenly mixes together and creates something original? It, that's what's fascinating. I have, I have in my office at work many, many, many tomes of jewelry. Um, you know, there's, there's those overview ones, like 7,000 years of jewelry and things like this. And then there's these really intense ones. I got a book once on Victorian day jewelry. And the interesting thing is, all you usually see is the fine jewelry, the diamonds and stuff. And this book has the hair jewelry, and it has steel jewelry, and it has the beautiful Scottish jewelry. I, I adore the Scottish jewelry that's all, you know, the the skill that went, goes into that stuff is incredible. And it used to be almost souvenir pieces, you know, that they would give away at fairs. But partly I like history. And so reading about the history of jewelry is really, I mean, it went along with all the other histories. And I think it's fascinating. I mean, the whole thing of everybody having a revolution and melting everything, you know, mm -hmm. which is just like, ah. Uh, I mean, the British, Crown jewels are, you know, only date. You don't have any real 11th century, you know, or before stuff. It's all with Cromwell, you know, when they had their revolution, bang, melted everything and uh, paid for guns with it. And, but interestingly enough, the Russians didn't. Now, don't you think that's fascinating? If any country was going to do it, but you can go see Peter the Great's crown at the Hermitage. And so I just think that's a mindful, you know, that, you know, first of all, it's so ridiculous to just throw away beautiful historical jewelry. And, uh, and then what countries do it and what countries don't is really strange. But yeah, it probably has to do that I just really like history, you know. <laughs> We had one more over here. Yep. We had two and then three. And we have probably time for two more questions. Well, be sure you get her. Yeah, She'll yeah, we're going to get her. She's been waiting over quite here. Yeah. Um, you keep throwing out names of these amazing different movies and series that you've done work for, and it keeps being like, oh, that one too, that one too, that's amazing. <laughs> um, a couple that you threw out uh, casually were. Babylon 5 and um, Big Trouble in Little China. Could you just briefly say what Babylon you did for those? Babylon 5 was a wonderful series to work on. Anne Bruce was the designer, and she also had come from a theatrical background. And, um, and she was wildly creative and invented things that, uh, you know, I mean, just the insignia, that's fine, you know, that's no big deal. But, uh, you know, stuff like the great big star pin thing, that they, you know, there were, and the uh, beautiful kind of ranger pins or whatever they were. My partner Tom did all these sculptures of the two figures and, and then we mounted the stone from behind 
It was great. And Big Trouble for a Little China designer was April Ferry. And uh, she's a real good designer. And she, um, and they had to have all these figures come to life, these great big um, figures, these Chinese god type figures that were stone, were supposed to come to life. And so they had us make one kind of metal one, you know, with the big shoulders and breastplate and everything. So the sculptor would copy our thing. And also then when it got to actually shooting it, they would they could cut an actor in there wearing this thing. And then we made the three uh, accomplice Chinese guys had these big buckles about well, uh, through, the, um, through the mouth of the, so they're masks. And those were fun. Those were fiberglass, but they were lots of fun. It was, it was, a, it was a good show to work on. Plus I got to meet one of the best milliners in the world, which is Harry Rotz, his name was. And his work was just supremely beautiful. And he, was, he retired not too long ago. He sort of looked like Sam Shepard. Everybody, every girl just thought he was just the absolute end. But um, they, yeah, I think the last thing I worked with him on was this crazy movie called, it was a, supposed to be a comedy of martial arts things called Balls of Fire. <laughs> <laughs> and it was uh, about, instead of martial arts, it was uh, ping pong. <laughs> And some guy ended up to Christopher Walken played the Chinese world <laughs> guy. You know, it's just one of those things you say, who okayed this? <laughs> you know, he said, let's make that movie. <laughs> we have one more here. I know that Jewish mysticism was a big part of um, how Leonard Nimoy related to his character, and it, it showed in a lot of the jewelry, to my way of thinking. And what I'm curious to know is, did you have anything to do with that? And if not, is there any sort of um, religious iconography or mysticism, as there's a lot of history related to jewelry, um, that influences you and your work in movies or TV shows that you've done? Well, my personal religion, I'm just an Episcopalian, <laughs> you know, uh, it really can't, except for only historically speaking, you have to be able to understand all that and what it means to the people who worship it in order to make it in a in a way that would relate to how they feel. Uh, we have, I have a lot of books in my shop library of signs and iconography from various, like the Vikings and, you know, and what they believed and why they used this symbol and what it meant. And I think those things are very important, you know. I, is that helping to... <laughs> So we want to uh, bring out one person to wrap up, uh, begin wrapping up our talk. Um, Julia has a little something for Maggie. Oh. Hello. Hi. So I'm the outreach person at Artisans Asylum, and <laughs> my name is Julia. And on behalf of Artisans Asylum, um, we want to, and the planning committee, and Karen, we want to thank you, Maggie, for coming. And we had such an amazing time hearing your stories. Yay. Thank you. I've had a lot of fun being yeah. here today, and I was terrified. <laughs> so thank you for making fun for me and keep doing the good work at Artisans Asylum and uh, just all the best to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.